for his steadfast love endures forever. Our next reading is from Matthew 21. When they had come near Jerusalem and had reached Bethpage at the Mount of Olives, Jesus sent two disciples saying to them, go into the village ahead of you and immediately you will find a donkey tied and a colt with her. Untie them and bring them to me. If anyone says to you, why are you untying her? Just say this, the Lord needs them and he will send them immediately. This took place to fulfill what had been spoken through the prophet saying, tell the daughter of Zion, look, your king is coming to you, humble and mounted on a donkey and on a colt, the foal of a donkey. The disciples went and did as Jesus had directed them. They brought the donkey and the colt and put their cloaks on them and he sat on them. A very large crowd spread their cloaks on the road and others cut branches from the trees and spread them on the road. The crowds that went ahead of him and that followed were shouting, Hosanna to the son of David. Blessed is the one who comes in the name of the Lord. Hosanna in the highest heaven. When he entered Jerusalem, the whole city was in turmoil, asking, Who is this? The crowds were saying, This is the prophet, Jesus from Nazareth in Galilee. If you will get your palm branches and turn to hymn number 197, Hosanna, loud Hosanna, singing verse 3 only, verse 3. Good morning. Let's turn our hearts and minds to the Lord. Let us face this day of palms and Jesus' passion with honesty, confessing our sin before God. Holy God, be sure of your faithfulness, even in your dying, comforted by your compassion toward your people in every age. We beg your mercy for our imperfect everything. Forgive our failings. Heal what we have broken, nurture what we have neglected, and lead us to your vision so that we may know the peace of wholeness in you. In Jesus' name, amen. Your God has come to you, humble, in the form of a slave, to free you from the weight of sin and death. Jesus' obedient suffering has released you. Your sins are forgiven in the name of the one who is exalted beyond what we can comprehend, Christ our Savior and Lord. Thanks be to God for his mercy. Now it's time for more of the delightful Chime Choir special music.
Let your word, O God, break open our hearts this day through the power of the Holy Spirit, that we may enter into the coming Holy Week with the same mind that was in Christ Jesus. Amen. Our first scripture is Isaiah from Isaiah 50. The Lord God has given me the tongue of a teacher that I may know how to sustain the weary with a word. Morning by morning he wakens, wakens my ear to listen as those who are taught. The Lord God has opened my ear and I was not rebellious. I did not turn backward. I gave my back to those who struck me and my cheeks to those who pulled out the beard. I did not hide my face from insult and spitting. The Lord God helps me, therefore I have not been disgraced. Therefore I have set my face like flint, and I know that I shall not be put to shame. He who vindicates me is near. Who will contend with me? Let us stand up together. Who are my adversaries? Let them confront me. It is the Lord God who helps me who will de- and who will declare me guilty. Second scripture is Philippians 2, verses 5 through 11. Let the same mind be in you that was in Christ Jesus, who, though he was in the form of God, did not regard equality with God as something to be exploited, but emptied himself, taking the form of a slave, being born in human likeness, and being found in human form, he humbled himself and became obedient to the point of death, even death on a cross, Therefore, God also highly exalted him and gave him the name that is above every other name, so that in the name of Christ Jesus, every knee should bend in heaven and on earth and under the earth, and every tongue should confess that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God the Father. The word of God for the people of God. Praise be to the Lord. By way of a couple of announcements, uh, remember that this Thursday night is Monday Thursday service at 6.30. We will not be doing foot washing, so please feel comfortable to come. Um, Easter Sunrise is out at Kokosing. It is sponsored by Fredericktown Area Churches. I think that's at 7 a.m. We will have an Easter breakfast here, coffee, cake, and casseroles. Uh, at 9, and Nancy will be leading our Easter service, and we may have men's breakfast on Saturday. Looks like I have a nod, yes? <laughs> Eat your way through the weekend. And we have joys. We have birthdays. Mandy, Larry, and Rosemary all have birthdays this week, so if you see any of them, wish them a very joyous birthday. Do we have any other joys or concerns? Let us turn to our prayer hymn, number 215, What Wondrous Love Is This?
Let us go to the Lord in prayer. Gracious God, we praise you and thank you for the opportunity to be here together in worship. Help us to quiet our minds and hearts so that we may be fully present here with your spirit and your word. Keep us ever mindful and encourage us by your word. As we come into your presence this morning, we offer up our thanks and praise for Jesus. You sent your son to give us hope for so many things, for salvation, for healing, for grace, peace, mercy, renewal, forgiveness, reconciliation, and so much more. Our Savior came to us humbly, riding on a donkey, proclaiming a message of peace. May we never forget that he chose to make that ride, which ended at Calvary, for our sake. May we also remember that you suffered in giving of your son, just as we suffer when we lose those that we love. You understand the pain of loss and separation. We thank you for making a way for us to be reunited with you and thereby reunited with those whom you gave to us to love. We bring to you our concerns for peace and unity in our churches, our communities, and in our world. We lift up to you all who are frustrated, angry, and seeking to do harm. Soften their hearts. Replace frustration with understanding anger with wisdom, and harmful intent with gentleness and mercy. Guide our leaders. Give them wisdom for reconciliation and unity with a focus toward meeting the many needs of your creation. May we always turn to you in our time of trouble. We pause now to lift up from our hearts all of those for which we carry heavy burdens, for those recovering from surgery, for those who are ill, for those who just need you, Lord. Lord, I know that you always watch over each and every one of us. We are all of great value in your eyes. We thank you and ask you to help us to always recognize your great love for us. We come to you with thanksgiving, praying the prayer that Jesus taught us. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. Before we go into our scripture reading today, I want to pause for just a moment and reflect. We are preparing our hearts and minds to walk with Jesus through this holy week through the darkness that will turn to light again next Sunday. So let us retrace our steps and remind ourselves what the scriptures have taught us about who Jesus is. Even before the Lenten season began, we were introduced to Jesus as the light of the world. Jesus came to illuminate our way, to shine the light of truth into our darkened world in order to bring to us understanding and to dispel our misconceptions. Before Jesus came, we knew only the world of darkness in which we perceived no hope. We trembled in the blackness which lay on the face of all things. That is, until love came to set our soul free. Without Jesus, we knew only obscurity and stillness, emptiness and regret. Now we have hope and joy. Our Lenten exploration showed us example after example with increasing clarity the divinity of Jesus. We studied studied the Beatitudes in which Jesus taught us from first-hand knowledge what kingdom values look like 
and what character traits are esteemed in heaven. We watched as Jesus outmatched Satan by raising the word of God as a shield against deception and temptation. We learned about the devil's tricks and how to respond to his deceitful ways with God's word and with God's help. We saw the divinity of Jesus proven in miracles our studies focused on two very special miracles which verified his holiness. First, Jesus healed the man born blind. But it was more than that. Jesus healed not only the man's sight, but also his ability to see. Man can remove a cataract, replace a cornea, repair a torn retina, but if this is done to one who has no concept of sight, then it kind of just results in chaos. For to see, we must comprehend sight. You see, when Jesus heals, he heals completely. Not only does Jesus make it possible for us to see, but he makes it possible for us to understand what is seen. Next, we read about how Jesus raised Lazarus from the dead. Here we learn that Jesus not only had the power over the grave, but that he has deep love, compassion, and sympathy for those who grieve. We learn, too, that sometimes we must wait upon the Lord. But just because we have to wait does not mean that God does not care. We learn that we must trust. Simply trusting every day, trusting through a stormy way, even when my faith is small, Trusting Jesus, that is all. Those are the lyrics of, from the old hymn, Trusting Jesus. It goes on, brightly does his spirit shine into this poor heart of mine. While he leads, I cannot fall. Trusting Jesus, that is all. Trusting as the moments fly, trusting as the days go by, trusting him whate'er befall. Trusting Jesus, that is all. And here we come almost full circle in the story of our subsistence. We are approaching the end of the beginning. In the first moments of our existence, we chose death. We read in Genesis, and the Lord commanded him, saying, You may eat freely from every tree of the garden, but you must not eat from the tree of the knowledge of good and evil, for in the day that you eat of it, you will surely die. And of course, we did exactly that. We ate the forbidden fruit and chose death. Now we must choose life in Christ, trusting Jesus. That is all. For you see, we are not destined to remain prisoners of death. Jesus proved he had power over death when he raised Lazarus from the grave. The Pharisees witnesses, witnessed this, and they were afraid that should Jesus be allowed to continue, their station in life would be threatened. The Pharisees, or at least most of them, were narrow and zealous and selfish and envious, sordid in their ambitious and grasping in their aims. But what they didn't count on was that Jesus held the same power over the grave, even from within the grave. And this is the promise and the purpose of Easter. Yes, we read, Adam's sin brought punishment to all, but Christ's righteousness makes men right with God so that they can live. Adam caused many to be sinners because he disobeyed God, and Christ caused many to be acceptable to God because he obeyed. The Ten Commandments were given so that all could see the extent of their failure to obey God's law. But the more we see our sinfulness, the more we see God's abounding grace forgiving us. Before, sin ruled over all men and brought them to death. But now, God's kindness rules instead giving us right standing with God and resulting in eternal life through Jesus Christ, our Lord. We gained insight into this amazing truth when Jesus encountered the woman at the well. 
As Nancy pointed out for us, never once did Jesus tell her she must leave the man she was living with. Never once did he place judgment on her or reprimand her for living an immoral life. He didn't tell her to clean up her act so that she could be qualified to receive grace. No, Jesus just revealed to her what she would have if she believed, that she could have living water and never be thirsty again. O death, where then is your victory? Where then your sting? For sin, the sting that causes death, will all be gone, and the law which reveals our sin will no longer be our judge. How we thank God for all of this. It is he who makes us victorious through Jesus Christ, our Lord. Peter, James, and John got a glimpse of Christ's divinity on the mountain. They were privileged to hear the voice of God and to see Moses and Elijah in conversation with Jesus. They saw Jesus transfigured in which he truly shone like light. The light that Jesus claimed to be was not just metaphorical, but real and physical. From their experience, we learned that Jesus and Jesus only can save us from sin. The law can't, the prophets couldn't, but the grace of God changes our hearts. We learned also that Jesus chose to walk back down that mountain because the world, which includes you and me, was down there at base camp, being held by the bonds of sin and death. And Jesus knew that only he could set us free. He knew that he had two more roads to walk, one to Jerusalem and one to Emmaus, the first to die for our sins and the latter as our risen Savior. As we approach Holy Week, let us remember that before there can be joy in the morning, darkness had to fall. Now let us turn to our text. Now Jesus stood before the governor, and the governor asked him, are you the king of the Jews? Jesus said, You say so. But when he was accused by the chief priests and elders, he did not answer. Then Pilate said to him, Do you not hear how many accusations they make against you? But he gave him no answer, not even to a single charge, so that the governor was greatly amazed. Now at the festival the governor was accused accustomed to release a prisoner for the crowd, anyone whom they wanted. At that time, they had a notorious prisoner called Jesus Barabbas. So after they had gathered, Pilate said to them, Whom do you want me to release for you, Jesus Barabbas or Jesus, who is called the Messiah? For he realized that it was out of jealousy that they had handed him over. While he was sitting on the judgment seat, his wife sent word to him, have nothing to do with that innocent man, for today I have suffered a great deal because of a dream about him. Now the chief priests and the elders persuaded the crowds to ask for Barabbas and to have Jesus killed. The governor again said to them, Which of the two do you want me to release for you? And they said, Barabbas. Pilate said to them, Then what should I do with Jesus, who is called the Messiah? All of them said, let him be crucified. Then he asked, why, what evil has he done? But they shouted all the more, let him be crucified. So when Pilate saw that he could do nothing, but rather that a riot was beginning, he took some water and washed his hands before the crowd, saying, I am innocent of this man's blood. See to it yourselves. Then the people as a whole answered, his blood be on us and on our children. So he released Barabbas for them, and after flogging Jesus, he handed him over to be crucified. Then the soldiers of the governor took Jesus into the governor's headquarters, and they gathered the whole cohort around him. They stripped him and put a scarlet robe on him, and after twisting some thorns into a crown, they put it on his head. They put a reed in his right hand and knelt before him, mocking him, saying, 
Hail, King of the Jews! They spat on him and took the reed and struck him on the head. After mocking him, they stripped him of the robe and put, on his, own, put his own clothes on him. Then they led him away to crucify him. As they went out, they came upon a man from Cyrene named Simon. They compelled this man to carry his cross, and when they came to a place called Golgotha, which means place of a skull, they offered him wine to drink mixed with gall. But when he tasted it, he would not drink it. And when they had crucified him, they divided his clothes among themselves by casting lots. Then they sat down there and kept watch over him. Over his head they put the charge against him which read, This is Jesus, the King of the Jews. Then the two bandits were cruci crucified with him, one on his right and one on his left. Those who passed by derided him, shaking their heads and saying, You who would destroy the temple and build it in three days, save yourself. If you are the Son of God, come down from the cross. In the same way, the chief priests also, along with the scribes and elders, were mocking him, saying, He saved others. He cannot save himself. He is the King of Israel. Let him come down from the cross now, and we will believe in him. He trusts in God. Let God deliver him now, if he wants to. For he said, I am God's son. The bandits who were crucified with him also taunted him in the same way. From noon on, darkness came over the whole land until three in the afternoon. And about three o'clock, Jesus cried out with a loud voice, Eli, Eli, lama, sabachthani. That is, my God, my God. Why have you forsaken me? When some of the bystanders heard it, they said, This man is calling for Elijah. At once, one of them ran and got a sponge filled with sour wine, put it on a stick, and gave it to him to drink. But the others said, Wait, let's see whether Elijah will come to save him. Then Jesus cried again with a loud voice and breathed his last. At that moment, the curtain of the temple was torn in two from top to bottom. The earth shook, and the rocks were split. The tombs also were opened, and many bodies of the saints who had fallen asleep were raised. After his resurrection, they came out of the tombs and entered the holy city, and appeared to many. Now, when the centurion and those with him who were keeping watch over Jesus saw the earthquake and what took place, they were terrified and said, Truly, this man was God's son. I read somewhere once that some things aren't meant to be fixed. In response to Jesus' declaration that he must go to Jerusalem and be killed, Peter responded, Never, Lord, this shall never happen to you. Yet it had to happen. There was no way out except to go through because sometimes it is in the breaking that the light shines through. Let me repeat that. Some things aren't meant to be mended. Sometimes it's in the breaking that the light finally shines through. Before there can be joy in the morning, darkness must fall. Certainly this is true of Christ's light, but what of us? We're like those two thieves on the crosses next to Jesus. We're sinful and broken and deserving our punishments. And we hang there at a crossroads. In Luke's account, the thieves on the cross, they don't both mock Jesus. One does, but the other says, remember me when you come into your kingdom. You see, we're not alone in our sinful state. Jesus is with us. More than that, he took our sin upon himself so that he could offer us the promise of paradise. Will you accept your brokenness so that Christ's light can shine through you? Will you let his light illuminate and heal your soul? Will you let the light of his love bring warmth to your heart and fill your days with hope? Or will you, in your darkest hour, 
forget that he is the light and mock him and turn away. The thing is, we need to understand that the shattered places in our lives are just cracks in the shell of our sin in which God's light can enter in. The divinity and the greatness of Jesus was, is in his being. Christ's forgiveness is limitless. His patience is inexhaustible. There is no end to his generous generosity, no threshold to his mercy. His wisdom is inscrutable and his kindness is tireless and ever reaching. His faith moved all mountains. His hope held no shadow of doubt and his love is infinite and everlasting. The greatness of Jesus is found in his obedience. It's found in his willingness to trade heaven for earth, joy for sorrow, purity for the stench of sin, reverence for mocking, the presence of angels for the ineptness of man, a throne of glory for homelessness, light for darkness, condemnation for mercy, and life for death, even death on the cross. And he did this for us so that we might have hope. The greatness of Jesus is that he loves you. Truly, he is the Son of God. Amen. Let our hosannas to the one who brings liberation take form in our tithes and offerings. God of all good gifts, we thank you for your great mercies. May these gifts lead to the building of your kingdom for the sake of those who need you so very much. We come to you with grateful hearts in the name of the one who came to draw all people to himself, Jesus Christ, our Savior. Amen. Join with me now in the reading of the Apostles' Creed. I believe in God, the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, and in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Ghost, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, dead, and buried. He descended into hell. The third day he rose again from the dead. He ascended into heaven and sitteth at the right hand of God, the Father Almighty, from thence he shall come to judge the quick and the dead. I believe in the Holy Ghost, the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. Let us sing together our communion hymn number 501, Feed Us, Lord.
be seated. Friends, this is the joyful feast of the people of God. They will come from east and west and from north and south and sit at the table in the kingdom of God. This is the Lord's table. Our Savior invites anyone who trusts in him to share the feast which he has prepared. It is truly right and our greatest joy to give you thanks and praise, O Lord our God, creator and ruler of the universe. In your wisdom you made all things and sustained them by your power. You formed us in your image, setting us in this world to love and serve you and to live in peace with your whole creation. When we rebelled against you, refusing to trust and obey you, you did not reject us, but still claimed us as your own. You sent prophets to call us back to your way. Then in the fullness of time, out of your great love for the world, you sent your only son to be one of us, to redeem us and heal our brokenness. Therefore, we praise you joining our voices with choirs of angels, with prophets, apostles, and martyrs, and with all the faithful of every time and place who forever sing to the glory of your name. Holy, holy, holy Lord, God of power and might, heaven and earth are full of your glory. Hosanna in the highest. Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. Hosanna in the highest. On the night before he died, Jesus took bread, and after giving thanks, he broke it and gave it to his disciples, saying, Take, eat, this is my body given for you. Do this in remembrance of me. In the same way, he took the cup, saying, This is the new covenant sealed in my blood, shed for you and for the forgiveness of sin. Whenever you drink it, do this in remembrance of me. Gracious God, pour out your Holy Spirit upon us and upon these, your gifts of bread and wine, that the bread we break and the cup we bless may be the communion of the body and blood of Christ through Christ, with Christ, in Christ, in the unity of the Holy Spirit, Spirit, all glory and honor are yours, almighty God, now and forever. Amen. The table is set.
the body of Christ given for you. Amen. The blood of Christ shed for you. Amen. We thank you, O God, that through word and sacrament you have given us your Son, who is the true bread from heaven and food of eternal life. So strengthen us in your service that our daily living may show our thanks. Through Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen. Let us stand together and sing our closing hymn, number 223, When I Survey the Wondrous Cross. Love and serve the Lord. Trusting Jesus, that is everything.